Greetings and salutations friends and welcome back to yet another lore breakdown video. We are now on Horus Heresy book 3, which could be considered to be the end of the first um, arc, I suppose, of Horus Heresy. This is where everything is going to go to hell in a handbasket at a rather high velocity. But we start out with a slightly smaller disaster. The worship of the God Emperor has spread throughout the expeditionary fleet. Apparently, after the whole saint thing and the banishing of, well, the literal goddamn fucking demon in the library, got a lot of people to think maybe this whole religion thing actually isn't so silly as it originally sounds. And again, bear this in mind, religious practices usually spread the best amongst the downtrodden. People with very little hope like to listen to stories of a great deity living somewhere up in the sky that can reach down and fix everything for them, because they are in a situation where everything seems pretty fucking hopeless. And considering the fact that a rather large percentage of the menials serving aboard Imperial warships have been um, unwillingly conscripted, shall we say, to Imperial service, a hopeless situation would be a pretty damn good description of their day-to-day -day life. Endless goddamn fucking drudgery, cleaning corridors, watching over pistons, doing random monotonous tasks that require absolutely no skills whatsoever, seeing as most of these people were quite literally shanghaied in, well, yes, the most literal sense of the word. And as such, a religion like the one preached by the Lectitio Divinatus would seem rather nice. It basically, it's talking about a giant golden sky daddy who loves all of his children and want to protect them. It's pretty much what you want to hear if you're one of the downtrodden masses now, isn't it? Though, there was one small problem. You see, Horus had taken a somewhat tougher stance against religiosity in his expeditionary fleet. Previous to Horus's return from Davin, religious worship of the Emperor was considered to be, well, quaint. It wasn't treated like other religions, which were outright despised and actively discriminated against, and, well, they did everything they could to exterminate them. It was considered to be a acceptable folly, so to say. The Emperor is a close to godlike being, and thusly it would be understandable if those with, um, shall we say limited mental capacity might confuse him with a god? These people were essentially considered to be, well, idiots, to put it rather bluntly. They were charming morons. They weren't seen as particularly subversive or any real danger or anything. They were just a curiosity of a bygone age. After Horus's return from Devin, however, they were no longer to be humoured in any way, shape, or form. And combat patrol of Sons of Horus would scour through the expeditionary fleet and just flat out kill anyone they found engaging in organised worship. Which is a pretty hard stance, considering that literally just days ago, they were considered to be essentially harmless. And the main reason, of course, for this uh, toughening of stance is undoubtedly the simple fact that these people would, rather obviously, be loyal to the Emperor first, and as such, well, Horus would have to kill them eventually, so might as well get started. Additionally, I'm sure that Horus, although probably not worried per se, was looking at the fact that this religion was spreading so quickly with a certain sense of what should I say, trepidation, perhaps. Undoubtedly, he wanted to make damn sure that this would not spread any further. He was, after all, contemplating a rebellion, and if by any chance this religious worship would spread into the Imperial Army, well, that would make things considerably more complicated. As for the reason why, precisely, this little idea of the God Emperor started spreading so quickly, well, it was primarily due to three things. One, the saint herself, of course, banishing a demon, as previously mentioned. Two, Kirill Sindemann had discovered the light. Now, Kirill Sindemann, as we've talked about before, was a bit of a mentor to Loken and a very, very, very good iterator. Five minutes alone with this guy in a room, and he could have you thinking that your own feces tasted like the finest steak you have ever had. He was that good. 
And the idea he was currently pushing was a hell of a lot easier. Again, he was essentially talking about a kindly grandfather who protects everyone, because remember, the Emperor protects, to a bunch of downtrodden people in need of protection. And three. And this is by far the best one. He had access to a ridiculously good book when it came to, um, proselytizing the good faith. Namely, of course, the Lectitio Divinatus. Literally, the book of the God Emperor, written by Lorgar Aurelian, the Primarch. And you know, when a Primarch does something, he does it pretty goddamn well. This thing, undoubtedly, was the finest piece of theological work ever produced in the goddamn galaxy, undoubtedly preempting every single argument and answering it with a platitude that was reassuring, yet also virtually impossible to actually disprove. Consider it to be kind of, um... Well, I'd go so far as to call it the Codex Astartes for religion. That is how good this goddamn thing was. But I wouldn't mention any of that to Lorgar if I were you. He's still a tiny little bit sore about the fact that he essentially wrote the book on, well, how to defeat chaos. Because, well, as the saint so aptly demonstrated, yelling at a demon if you yell about the correct things will actually make the demon go away, so, um... Again, hashtag blame Lorgar. He literally did everything wrong to everyone. There is quite literally not a man, woman, child, or Xenos in the galaxy, or demon for that matter, that Lorgar has not wronged in some way, which is quite an achievement in and of itself. And speaking of fucking things up royally, it turns out that the warp is about to do just that. Conveniently for Horus's plans, a massive warp storm is forming. This is going to make communication, well, difficult at best and virtually impossible in most cases. Now this does have some potential downsides. It might mean that Horus will be unable to communicate with his various companions and therefore not be able to well, organize anything, but at the same time, it will also give him the perfect cover for him to carry out his own betrayal. It would seem that uh, the forces in the warp are moving to help out their boy Horus, even though he himself at this point clearly is not aware that that is what they are doing. In fact, at this point in time, it would appear as if Horus has not really allied himself, quote-unquote, to the forces of chaos just yet. He appears to view them as a third party in this conflict. He is betraying the Emperor, not for the chaos powers or anything else like that. He is betraying the Emperor for himself, for his own reasons. The chaos gods, as far as he is concerned, are... At the moment, at best, a semi-benevolent third party, and at worst, potentially an interference. And it is going to be quite a while yet until he fully aligns himself with the forces of Chaos, but Chaos, of course, well, they've been planning this for quite a while, and they are already doing anything and everything in their power to back up Horus. And speaking of rebellion... The first few vague outlines of said deed were starting to manifest themselves. First and foremost, Horus had closed his inner circle. Those he was not sure he could trust, Loken and Tariq Torgaden, had been excluded from, well, not the Mournival per se, but from Horus's vicinity. They very rarely spoke to him directly, if ever and they barely had any kind of contact anymore with their Mournival brothers. Additionally, people who were on their side were slowly but surely being ostracized from, shall we say, social life. As social a life as an Astartes has, anyways. And of course, the civilian population of the ships, which essentially means the Remembrances, were all locked in their quarters. Malaghus had issued an edict stating that no Remembrancer was allowed to move anywhere aboard the ship unless they possessed a written authorization from Malaghus himself, or, to be more precise, from Lupacal's court. Huh. Interesting name. This, rather unsurprisingly, made the Remembrances just a teensy-weensy bit worried, and considering that one of their numbers had so recently, um, 
killed himself. That being Ignas Carcassi, of course, who, again, killed himself. They were all getting worried that something was about to happen to them in particular. And, well, considering the recent restructuring of their freedoms and the fact that the one person who had actively spoken out against the Warmaster and the atrocity that had taken place in the landing decks, well, you can see where they're coming from. Though some were considerably more worried than others. Kirill Sinderman, now being a little bit of a, um, how shall we say, not exactly a hunted man, because nobody really knew what he was up to with the whole religiosity and stuff, but still, he was a powerful civilian that could cause some serious damage if he was ever to, well, decide to do so. As such, he was placed under rather considerable scrutiny, as all of the Remembrancers were, though of course a fair few of them still managed to move about undetected. Clearly, the War Master's edicts had not yet entirely shut down all movement, but Kirill Sinderman had something else to worry about. He received a sign saying that the saint was in danger, which was rather accurate considering Horus had just sent Miss Vivar's ex-bodyguard to make sure that the saint would have no miraculous resurrection. Now, whether or not Horus, or indeed the body around him, was particularly worried about the saint doing anything like banishing demons was unlikely, but again, they undoubtedly recognized the danger of the growing popularity of this new cult of the emperor, and if this saint was the linchpin of said cult, well... Decapitate the priest, and the church will most certainly die. Kirill Sinderman, of course, was of the opinion that this was Big E speaking to him personally, or possibly the saint, but some kind of divine being was telling him that he needed to save the saint. Now this, of course, posed a few small problems. One, Kirill Sinderman was not allowed to leave his room, and two, Kirill Sinderman was an old man who now had to take on an augmented bodyguard challenge level significant, in other words. However, he was, as mentioned, a rather smooth-talking gentleman, and managed to talk his way out of his room, convincing the two guards outside that he was but a poor old frail man that wanted to go to the Medica deck to see his daughter before she dies. Oh, golly good. All very, very tragic, as I'm sure you understand, and the guards apparently agreed. And they wrote him a chip, allowing him to travel to the Vengeful Spirit's Medica deck to see this woman who was like a daughter to him. That only leaves problem number two, namely the augmented bodyguard. However, fate once again intervened. It turns out that a pair of Titan crewmen had also received warnings, stating that the saint was somehow in danger, and that they should be heading to the Medica decks, where they ran into Kirill Sinderman. Being military personnel, these two were actually armed, in sharp contrast to Kirill himself. They arrived in time to get the saint out of her medica bed, but were caught while trying to move her by Petronella Vivar's old bodyguard, Magard. This was when an actual miracle happened. Magard is, of course, a ridiculously heavily augmented superhuman, and the Warmaster, as a reward for his faithful service, had rewarded him with several more augmentations. Now, Magard was far too old to be turned into a space marine, but he could be given many, many new implants, making him faster, stronger, tougher, and considerably more lethal than one old man and a couple of Titan crew members. By the time the poor crew members had even pulled their weapons, Weapons, Magard had already fired three bullets in their direction. This is, of course, when aforementioned miracle happened. The saint awoke, or at the very least, part of her awoke, for a short period of time, and she cast a spell, or some form of psychic power, or hell, even just, let's call it, a miracle on the nearby area, freezing time, or, well, slowing it down to an extreme degree, to the point where they could actually see the third round exiting Magard's pistol. 
This gave the three plenty of time to escape, and as far as Magard know, he'd barely seen anything. He had seen the vague outline of three people moving what he presumed to be the saint, and then they were gone. Quite the fucking magic trick. Though I would like to point out that if one of them had simply just put their last gun to Magad's skull and went pew, that would have solved a hell of a lot of problems, or brained him with a piece of furniture, or, you know, something. Slightly risky, yes, but kinda worth it. But hey, the important part was of course that the saint was safe, thanks to this little magic trick, and thanks to the mysterious messages. Mysterious messages, apparently sent from Big E himself, except not really. These messages had been sent by Horus' chief astropath, Ing Mei Sing. It would appear that after the events in the library, where of course Sing was present, she had seen the uh, quote-unquote light, and had decided that the saint's life was important enough for her to risk her own, because... She's far from the only psyker on this ship, and broadcasting messages like that, well, in all due likelihood she would be discovered, and indeed she was. The Saint was safe, as was Kirill Sindeman and the Titan crew members. Ing Mei Sing, however, well, it turns out that the new Warmaster is not exactly the forgiving sort. And just as it happens, Erebus had a purpose for the newfound traitor in their midst. Erebus wanted to summon a demon, so that it could have a little bit of a heart-to-heart -heart with Horus and reassure the Warmaster that the entities in the warp were entirely beneficent and on his side. And what is usually required to summon a demon? Well, a sacrifice, of course. Not only did he kill the poor astropath, he also sent her soul to literal hell. Horus is a horrible person. And what makes it even worse, of course, is that Ing Mei Sing was an astropath. She knew precisely what kind of butt-fucking she was getting herself into. Ugh, cruel and unusual. But luckily for us, it does give us a rather interesting little tidbit, so I'm going to quote directly from the book here, and this is the demon speaking. Quote, He meddles in matters he does not understand, this is in reference to the Emperor, on the world you call Terra. His grand designs cause a storm in the warp that tears it asunder from within. End quote. This is rather interesting. Because it's a little bit hard to decipher. It sounds as if the demon is blaming the Emperor's great works for the chaos in the warp, the warp storms. But then the same demon goes on to say that they are causing the warp storms that have blinded the Emperor's legions. It might be that the demon is referring to the fact that the Emperor's great work is affecting the warp in a chaotic way, tearing it asunder, but that they are the ones that are clouding the warp for travel. It's a little bit hard to decipher, but I'm assuming that's what they mean here, because they also point out that while they can cause storms to appear in the warp, they can also calm the warp. And this is the assistance they are offering to the Warmaster. Again, they say that they care nothing for the mortal world, which we know is bullshit. All they want is for the Emperor to stop doing whatever he is doing. And in return for Horus' service in disposing of the Emperor, they will allow him to travel through the warp unhindered, and they will also help him out in doing so. The interesting part is also, though, what exactly is the Emperor doing? Because as far as we know, he's basically screwing with the webway. How would this directly affect the warp unless he is trying to find some way of entirely separating humanity from the warp? Or perhaps that might even be a little bit of an overreach. Perhaps the Chaos Demons simply understand that if the Emperor gains access to the Webway Network and can move his forces unopposed and supremely quickly across the galaxy, he is guaranteed to win. And if the Emperor wins, the forces of Chaos are in all due likelihood living on borrowed time as he continues to wipe out any and all traces of religion. At the end of their little conversation, the Warmaster was more or less convinced that these entities 
were, while still not precisely allies, at the very least they were positively inclined towards his endeavour. Although again, he seems very reluctant to trust them with anything particularly important. Additionally, he says that he will cleanse his legions on Istvan without their help, and only after Istvan will he pledge himself to their masters, the Chaos Gods. Although I do suspect that Horus is not really interested so much in pledging himself as he is to gain whatever help from them that he possibly can. Erebus, in turn, is overjoyed by the fact that the Warmaster is finally starting to see the darkness, and says that Erebus will be absolutely overjoyed to hear the news that the Warmaster has finally decided to turn his attention to their new allies. Interestingly enough, we can already see the beginnings of schisms as well. Erebus talks of harboring secrets for himself and hoarding them. It would seem that already at this early point in time, the worshippers of chaos are hoarding knowledge and rituals, etc., connections, so on, for themselves rather than sharing them with their legions. That sure didn't take long, did it? I remind you again, at this point, Erebus hasn't really been steeped in the whole lore of the war for particularly long. In fact, this demon summoning ritual that he just carried out was something relatively new to him. And yet, despite that, we are already seeing the bonds of brotherhood break down. Now, in the case of Lorgar's Legion, there are plenty other reasons why that might be happening, but as we will see relatively soon with the Sons of Horus, it is pretty goddamn clear that Chaos does indeed corrupt. And speaking of corruption... You see, Horus had already started corrupting himself and his ship without even knowing it. This is the true horror, I suppose, of Chaos, the insidious nature of it all. As previously mentioned, he had established something known as Lupercal's Court, where Horus held well, court. Rather obvious, I know, but still. It has, of course, symbolic value, and in Lupercal's court were hung many, many new and unknown banners. We know this because Loken saw them and went like, well, I don't know what these are, and he assumed they came from the Warrior Lodge. Now, judging by the description, it seems fairly obvious that these are indeed Chaos banners, depicting the Skull Rune of Corn and stuff like that. Of course, in 40k, these icons alone have a certain amount of power. Their power is of course limited due to the simple fact that most don't know what they are, but they still do have a certain distorting effect upon reality. And seeing as they are now hanging in the main strategium of the Vengeful Spirit, that is going to have quite an effect on everything. But more interesting is what is behind them. After saving the Saint, Kirill Sindeman manages to send Loken a message saying, look for the temple. Now to begin with, that might sound like a rather ridiculous idea. Look for the temple aboard the Vengeful Spirit, a warship that has been fighting against any form of organized worship for a very, very long time indeed. And yet, Loken of course knew that Sindeman was not crazy, so there was probably something to it. And he, of course, knew where Lupical's court is, and how it was very, very different from pretty much anything else aboard the ship, the banners being a rather big peculiarity. So he enters the court when nobody's around and quickly notices that behind one of the banners is an alcove, leading to a small room that somehow seems to be detached from the ship at large. In Loken's own words, it would seem as if the room was somehow different from everything else. It had a different scent, a different feel to it, as if it was not wholly located aboard the Vengeful Spirit. And the reason for this was in all your likelihood the giant leather-bound tome that was located in the small room at the end of the tunnel. A small temple, unsurprisingly. The book has power. A lot of power. In all due likelihood, it is one of Lorgar's books. And even just being near it, looking upon it, is more than enough for Loken to know that this is some seriously 
wrong ass shit. All of it has the stink of the warp about it, and Loken now knows that the warp has gotten a hold of his legion. In fact, it is dwelling within the heart of his legion, barely 20 yards from Horus Lupercal's seat. That is rather obviously not a good thing. And Loken understands that he needs to do something and he needs to do it quickly, which makes it even more confusing that he then goes on to not do anything quickly. Oddly a fuck enough. Granted, at this point in time, Loken does not exactly have the full support of everyone, but you'd think this would be more than enough to ring the goddamn alarm bells. If nothing else, he could at the very least organize a couple companies, his own, Tariq Torgaidens, and probably a fair few others, and launch what it would essentially be a preemptive attack on everyone else. Even though he would not be entirely certain who his enemy was, he could be damn sure that if he caused a big enough ruckus, they would come out to face him. Instead, he decides to close the book and leave and kinda not really do anything about it. The campaign against Istvan is already underway, and by the way, we'll get into that in a moment, so... You'd think this would be the perfect time to strike, or at the very least start looking for allies, but he doesn't, which confuses me a fair bit. Anyways, about Istvan. So, the Crusade has received a distress message that was picked up by the Death Guard. This distress message came from the system of Istvan that had been taken over by what appears to be some form of chaos-influenced cultists. Although, of course, in this case, they worship a local deity. The distress call is received by the Death Guard initially and then relayed to the Warmaster via Mortarion. Horus then calls upon Fulgrim and Angron to gather the forces of the Death Guard, the World Eaters, the Emperor's Children, and the Sons of Horus to all descend upon Istvan. A ludicrously out of proportion response, considering the fact that Istvan is basically one small system that rebelled relatively recently. They couldn't possibly have done anything to warrant the attention of four full legions. But the real reason, of course, will be revealed a bit later. This puts, of course, the entire Legion on a war footing. This is probably part of the reason why Loken didn't do anything, because he figured he could do this first and then try and look into what is wrong after this campaign, not wanting to kick up any shit in the middle of a military campaign. Which, though, again kind of confuses me, because he seems convinced about what he's fighting now. It's the warp. He knows how bad that could be, and yet again he kind of chooses to just let it lie for the time being. I'm really confused by all of that. Anyways, the campaign against Isvan has begun. The plan is nice and simple. Smash right through all of the outlying outposts protecting Isvan, and then land upon the planet itself. This does mean knocking out a few of the outlying areas first, like asteroid bases, etc., one of which is taken by a combined force of Emperor's Children and Death Guard, where we get to see the first example of Fabius Bile's new project. Bile has been playing around with the Starty's biology for quite a while at this point, and has started to augment certain leaders within the Emperor's Children command structure, one of them being Adolin, a Lord Commander and one of Fulgrim's closest officers. Adolin has been modified to scream like a bitch turning his voice into a sonic weapon. He utilizes this during the fight on Istvan Extremis, a small asteroid outpost. But surprisingly enough, nobody reacts again, which really fucking confuses me. Hundreds of Astartes saw the Lord Commander do something that flat out wasn't possible. In fact, they were currently under attack by a war singer, somebody that uses the power of the warp to turn singing into a physical weapon, a barrage of sound. And now, this obviously being bullshit magic and therefore bad, Lord Commander Adolin does the exact same thing, and yet every single Astartes in the room doesn't immediately go, Hold on a fucking tick. That's not normal. 
And while again, of course, the Astartes at this point don't really have any real grasp of the warp or chaos per se, so they wouldn't necessarily identify this as a mutation, but they would most definitively understand that that is simply not something an Astartes could, or should, be able to do. You'd think there'd be some kind of reaction, but nope, zero, zip, nilch, null, nada. Which is again rather confusing. And in fact, it requires something completely different to get any kind of internal conflict going within the Emperor's children. So, here's what happened. Saul Tarvitz is starting to kick up some shit because things are changing. Quickly. And he's worried about it. Very worried. So Adolin, for some mysterious reason, decides to take Tarvitz, bring him to Fabius Bile, introducing him and going, okay, so this is the place where we make horribly mutated Astartes. And again, I'm just sitting there like, what? Sal Tarvitz, the man that has throughout the book series been described as the straightest, most uptight motherfucker to have ever existed within the Emperor's children, somebody so tight-assed that he could easily be confused for an Imperial fist, and this is the guy Adolin chooses to take with them to show the various biological experiments that Fabius is doing in the basement? <laughs> what? I gotta admit, here's the thing. I really like Ben Counter as an author, he's gotten a lot of shit for a lot of stuff, but I genuinely like most of his writing. Hell, I really enjoyed The Furious Abyss, which a lot of people didn't, but I feel like he's completely dropped the ball on how the characters would actually react in these situations. I mean, maybe he's working off a prearranged script here, but it just kind of doesn't really make any sense. Loken knows that something really bad is growing at the heart of his legion, a literal cancer, yet decides to push off any reaction to this until after the campaign. Lord Commander Adolin takes one of the most straight-assed members of his entire legion down to see the insane apothecary in the basement. What? And the best part is, at the end of this, they then just don't do anything. Even Saul Tarvitz, after having been shown the hideous shit that Fabius is doing, also decides to just kind of let it go. Really? I mean, you'd think he'd be grabbing a flamethrower or something at this point. And again, I do hasten to add a point in the defense of the author here, that at this point, violence between Astartes is still considered to be almost an impossibility, like something that just literally can't happen, but I feel like these events are really straining even that level of trust. Especially as we know all too well that their opposition is more than ready to begin fucking over their friends. Now granted, they have to some extent been tangentially affected by chaos, but the differences between the two are just too sharp, sudden, and it doesn't have enough build-up. It just seems like these two parts that were earlier at most, you know, vaguely opposed to each other on a kind of fuzzy background, are now complete and utter stellar opposites, and it kind of happened off screen, which I don't like. I think that's kind of lazy writing, as if they wrote the first and the second Horus Heresy book and they went like, shit, um, we actually need to finish up this in the third and get moving in the Horus Heresy. And so they just kind of made everyone collide really, really quickly and really, really violently. But enough about that, because we do get another interesting little lore tidbit. This, I think, is crucial to understanding the Emperor's children and why they fell from grace. I am quoting Lord Commander Adolin here. Quoting, For the Chosen, those sacrifices are great. Foremost amongst these is the fact that everything is secondary to victory. End quote. This is really telling. So you might remember the plant of murder, where Lord Commander Aedlin, in an effort to help out blood angels trapped on the plant of murder, sent down his shit and got well, the shit kicked out of him, basically. And he got chewed the fuck out by Horus afterwards. This dented his ego rather severely, to put it very, very mildly. And he felt as if he had not only been defeated, but humiliated. This means that he wanted to push himself past any known limits. Everything 
is secondary to a victory. Everything is secondary to him regaining his honour, and so he is willing to let himself be strapped down to Fabius Bile's table and let the apothecary carry out whatever insane experiments he's dreamt up on him to make him faster, stronger and better. Because again, everything, even his body, even his purity, is secondary to victory. Because the Emperor's children are perfect, and any kind of imperfection can not be tolerated. This in turn obviously meant that the rest of the Emperor's children would have to be purified. And now we find ourselves above the planet Istvan and the final assault is being prepared. Now, normally, when a legion is about to attack a planet, forces are organised into spear tips. These spear tips consist of multiple companies that are then under the command of their individual company commanders with one or more officers in overall charge. Now, this of course being a cooperative effort between four legions, there would be four individual spear tips. Normally, again, these would be made up of entire companies, however, this time, Horus had personally gone through every single squad in the Sons of Horus and designated which squads were and which squads were not to take part in the assault. He had handpicked the squads that were to attack in the first wave, and then the rest of the Sons of Horus would come down in the second wave. This was beyond unusual, it had never happened before, and even stranger, Loken and Tariq were put in command of the Sons of Horus elements, which was really strange. Leading a spear tip is obviously an honour, and yet these two, who were so clearly out of favour, were given the honour of leading it. Again, if I was Loken, I'd probably be asking myself, ha. Huh, this is really, really fucking strange, and there was that creepy ass book. Maybe something is up, but he doesn't. Though to be fair, this might also be a case of him hoping that everything is okay, and this being an indication that it is. He and Tariq, both being on the outside, are given the honour of leading the spear tip. Perhaps this is a sign from Horus saying, okay, I know we've had our differences, but I'm willing to let you back inside again. And therefore, I'm going to give you the honour of leading the spear tip, just to, you know, kind of smooth things out a little bit between us. That might very well be the reason. Because of course, Loken wants that to be the case. He wants his legion to go back to what it was, to be normal again. So it might simply just be a case of wishful thinking that makes him ignore the demons whispering in his ear saying that this is not right, everything's gonna go to fucking hell. And luckily, Saltavitz is not as naive, shall we say, after oh so surprisingly refusing Eidolon's offer to be enhanced, Saltavitz is given a place in the spear tip. But he is starting to realise that something is exceedingly wrong, and unlike Loken, he decides to try and do something about it. He goes to ancient Rylanor, a dreadnought and the Empress children master of ceremonies, and asks that he be given the honour of staying on the ship and fulfilling the role of Eidolon's second, who had died so recently. Now normally this would essentially be him saying, I knew this guy really well and I would like to honour him by taking up his duties, but he will at the same time be forfeiting the honour of going down in the spear tip, which is a fairly unusual thing. And in all due likelihood, ancient Rylanor saw right through him, but the ancient has also been noticing that shit's been slipping pretty goddamn badly. Being the master of ceremonies, he has realised that the Legion is slipping ever further away from their original ideals. He is also apparently of the opinion that their pursuit of perfection has turned into something far less noble. And it's not like they're lacking in evidence. Things are very, very strange, and I keep using that word, but, well, they really are. Now, of course, in the Sons of Horus, Especially picking out squads is exceedingly unusual, but within the Emperor's Children's, 
It is even more obvious. Not a single one of the Lord Commander's own favoured commanders are to take part in the drop. Not one of Lord Commander's favourite officers are going down in the spear tip. This means that the Lord Commander has refused every single one of them the honour of leading the assault. That would be utterly unheard of amongst the Emperor's children, a chapter in which personal glory and honour is ridiculously important. If this was done at any other time, Lord Commander Aedlin could in all your likelihood expect a full-blown fucking revolt from his very own officers. They would see it as the grossest insult to their personal honour. And yet, nobody's shaking the boat. Absolutely no one is kicking up a fuss over this. <laughs> ah, something smells like fish here. And due to aforementioned overwhelming smell of sushi, Ancient Rylanor allows Saltarvitz to remain behind on the fleet, which gives him direct access to a command console, and allows him to see exactly what is about to happen once the operation starts, and this is going to be very, very important indeed. And now of course we are about to enter into the Battle of Istvan itself. Now, this will probably be a full video in and of itself at some point, a proper video, where I'll be going over troop maneuvers and every last little bit that happens, but for the purpose of this video, which is basically just a simple lore breakdown, we'll be going through the highlights and some of the main events, rather than fussing too much about the details as there will be plenty of time to fuss over those in a proper video. So, the four legions were each responsible for one attack. The Sons of Horus would launch an attack against the planet's primary centre of worship inside of their capital city. The Emperor's children would launch an attack on the governmental palace and try to kill Prowl himself, the leader of this so-called rebellion. More like a heretical uprising, but hey, they didn't know that yet. The Death Guard would lead an attack on the main entrenchment system of the fortified city, landing quite literally directly on top of the defenders, and the World Eaters would launch an attack directly into the centre of the city. This would mean that if all four legions achieve their objectives, which being Legioni Sestatis, they probably would, the entire city would be well and truly under their control. Interestingly enough, not a single Primarch would be going down in the first wave, which is rather unusual, particularly as one of these Primarchs was fucking Angron. Normally you would have to physically restrain him to keep him from leading the assault, but not this time. Hmm, strange. And again, I have to pick on this because I really think this is one of the weakest parts of the book. Relatively speaking, I think this is the weakest of the first three books because so little makes sense here. Loken, Tariq, Saltavitz, Garo, nobody. Not even Karn. Karn is a pretty noble bastard by World Eater standards, okay? Nobody reacted to this. Not a single goddamn Primarch went down in the first wave. All of this strange shit and just... The only one who kicks up even a slight fuss is Tarvitz. And he's only kicking up a fuss because Lord Commander Eidolon took him down into the basement and showed him Fabius Bile's Hall of Fucking Horrors. I mean, it's just... God, why? But anyways, moving on. The four attacks go pretty damn well. There are some stiffer resistance than they had originally thought. For example, the World Eaters were originally thought of as a emergency reserve force. They would secure the city against whatever militia members was left behind, and then sweep on to aid one of the other three legions. However, the people of Istvan had been somewhat radicalized in the absence of the Imperium. This is another pretty clear evidence that they were probably corrupted by chaos, because every single last man, woman, and child picked up whatever weapons were at hand and threw themselves at the World Eaters. And so, before they could help anyone else, the World Eaters quite literally had to butcher millions of civilians that were just throwing themselves at them. And uh, while the World Eaters are pretty good at butchery, it did slow them down. The Empress children had a fair bit of success. They managed to break into the palace, defeating Pral's elite guard and then killing Pral himself. And it was Lucius, by the way, who finally killed the dictator. 
down in the trenches, the Death Guard were slowly but surely grinding the defenders to death. Granted, they probably could have done this more effectively, like orbital bombarding the position, but, well, considering the point of this entire operation, it makes sense that they would dump them right on top of the trenches. And over in the Siren Hold, the main temple of Istvan, the Sons of Horus were fighting their way through tight corridors and catacombs, defeating the war singers and the garrison defending the place. Now we pop back into orbit, and one of the few sane people in this entire story, Saul Tarvitz, who had managed to get himself in as a member of the command staff, and therefore had a fair bit of, um, perspective, shall we say. He noted that as soon as the first wave had been dispatched, the fleet started making some very strange movements. They began disengaging from the planet, removing all of their ships from orbital assault range and moving them into orbital bombardment range. This is a pretty major redistribution of the fleet's power. That is strange enough, but could be considered to be a precaution. Maybe in case there was a large enemy counterattack or something like that that they simply hadn't thought about. Possibly. And then all communication with the surface ceased. All of it was not cut off, it wasn't jammed, it just stopped. But luckily for the people down on the planet, the one man in four expeditionary fleets who actually had a brain, Sal Tarvitz, was back home in space. And looking at all of this, he was probably thinking, yeah, I'm pretty happy I stayed home today. And, seeing that something very weird was once again going on, he decided to have a little gander down to the bombardment decks to see if he couldn't figure out what exactly was going on. And, considering the fact that he was still on the fleet, the Magos in charge of the bombardment obviously assumed he was one of them, and so had absolutely no compunctions about telling him that they were loading up for a virus bombardment of the planet below. This was pretty much the last nail in the coffin. If the fleet had simply just retreated from orbit to launch a conventional bombardment, then that could have been the precursor to what is, relatively speaking, a pinpoint bombardment. As pinpoint as you get when you're firing at something from orbit anyways, that could be designed to attack a large concentration of reinforcements heading towards the Coral City. But virus bombs... Those are not subtle weapons, they are designed to scour planets, and there is absolutely no way whatsoever that you would be firing virus bombs at a planet with friendly troops on it, unless you were planning to wipe out the friendly troops as well. It was finally made abundantly clear to Saltarvitz that something had to be done, and that shit was about to hit the fan at supersonic velocity. Not knowing who to trust, and not exactly having a whole lot of time on hand, Saltarvitz decided that the only way he could get the good word out was to steal a Thunderhawk and head straight for the planet below. A somewhat dodgy preposition to put it rather bluntly, as he was quickly discovered by the various other ships in the fleet, which were at first really, really confused. What is a Thunderhawk doing? Why is it not flying according to any of the scheduled launches? Why is it heading for the planet below? Why didn't anybody tell anybody about this? The sheer level of confusion protected him for a short time, but very quickly, intercept aircraft were sent out to hunt him down. He was saved by Nathaniel Garrow, another character that we're going to be getting to know a fair bit about, and had been able to remain aboard the fleet due to an injury suffered taking Istvan Extremis. Though, we will also hear a little bit more about the reasons why he stayed on the fleet in a later book. For now, all you need to know is that he and Saul Tarvis were bestest best buds, and had long since promised to believe and trust in one another. And so, when Saul Tarvitz came screaming towards his ship in a stolen Thunderhawk saying, Please help me, the Warmaster is going to kill everybody, Garrow believed him, despite the fact that all of this sounded, of course, somewhat incredible. He ordered the two pursuit aircraft following the Thunderhawk to be shot down. The explosion of the pursuit aircraft also created enough shit in the atmosphere to make it virtually impossible for the fleet above to get a clean reading on what exactly had happened. As far as they knew, both the Thunderhawk and the pursuit aircraft had all been destroyed in a somewhat ill-aimed but effective volley from Nathaniel Garrow's ship, the Eisenstein. 
This in turn allowed Saul Tarvitz, the only man with a brain, to get down into the atmosphere and reach the landing forces via direct Voxlink, without the massive broadcast and signal boosters on the main fleet. He sent out the message saying that everybody needs to get to fucking cover now because a virus bombardment is going to start very, very soon. There was some general confusion amongst the ground troops, thinking, where the fuck is this coming from? Did the Istvan somehow manage to hide away virus bombs? What's happening? A lot of them simply did not know what was going on at all, but they knew that a fellow battle brother was telling them to get into fucking cover and to do it quickly, and so despite being exceedingly confused, they did so. There were a few amongst them that realized that this probably was considerably more than just the Istvans doing something nasty. Garvia Lok and Tariq Torgaden would in all due length they'd be kicking themselves right about now for not starting shit earlier. And the warning came in at the absolute last possible moment. Considerable parts of what is now to be known as the Loyalist forces managed to get into cover, either sequestering themselves in bunkers in the primary defense line, getting into various holdout positions beneath the various houses, bunkers, holdouts, the palaces, the siren halls, etc., whatever they could. The virus bombs are remarkably effective, but it can't eat through concrete. Yet. But anyone caught out in the open were all killed. It can't eat through the ceramite of battle plates, but it can more than happily eat through the weak joint armor in Legion Astartes power armor. And if even the slightest hint of the virus makes it inside, then the wearer is as good as dead as the virus begins tearing them apart on a molecular level. And it happens very very quickly, slow enough to be excruciatingly painful, but quick enough for you not to do anything about it. And whilst the Loyalists were desperately seeking cover, back up on the fleet, more stuff had happened. So, as we know, the Saint had been rescued from the Medica deck by Kirill Sinderman and a couple of Titan crew members, both of which were, by the way, down on the planet below right now, having their own little drama in one of their Titans. Their Titan commander was turning against them, and with Horus. The two Titan crew members had an argument and eventually the pro-Horus side won. However, back on the fleet once again. The saint was lying in a coma after defeating the demon and after doing the little miracle that had saved them from Magard, after which she had not stirred nor spoken for days. But now she awoke violently and suddenly after having a vision. A vision of what was about to happen to the loyal troops below. She knew that she could not prevent it, but she knew that she also had to get the fuck off the ship and, if at all possible, escape the expeditionary fleet entirely. Around this time, Malag has put out a decree saying that all the Rembrandts were to gather in one of the primary hangar decks to be addressed by Horus Lupercal himself on the future of the Crusade. Of course, Kirill Sinderman, the Saint, and everyone else knew this was probably a trap, but there would be a lot of people there, which meant that this would probably be their best chance of getting off the ship. And so all of them decided to attend, along with pretty much all the other Remembrances as well. You might be thinking, this seems like an obvious trap, why would anybody go? But, well, one, if you didn't go, they'd still hunt you down regardless, and two, you are a Remembrancer. You have been sent here specifically to document the great happenings of the Imperial Crusade, and now the War Master himself, after months of silence and all kinds of bullshit regulations, is finally going to come out and address all of the Remembrancers. Of course you would go, because, again, shit's been going a little bit sour recently, but still, nobody really expected what happened next to actually happen. The Remembrances were all gathered up in one of the hangar decks, where they were shown a picked feed of Istvan, as it was bombarded by the entire fleet. The Remembrances were told that the Loyalists were already down on the planet below, and that Horus' next step was to liberate humanity from the oppressive yoke of terror. Shortly thereafter, Horus gave the signal to kill every last one of the Remembrances. 
The hangar space were surrounded by Sons of Horrors who leveled their bolters and simply began to fire into the crowd. The butchery was considerable, quick and violent. But before this happened, the saint, knowing almost certainly what was going to happen, had used her saintly powers to divine herself away off the ship. You see, there was one member in the crowd who had not been ordered down to the surface of Istvan, which is a bit strange to be honest, that was still very very sympathetic to their cause. Namely, Iaction Cruz, also known as the Half Herd. Cruz had long since lost any kind of real standing or respect within the Legion. He was kept around as kind of a quaint reminder of times once past, babbling on about the Legion's former glories and stuff like that. He was mostly just ignored, which is why he was known as the Half Herd. However, he was also clearly very, very much so loyal to Terra and the original principles of the Legion. And despite being again the half herd, you would have thought that Horus would not have kept somebody like that around, and yet, here he is. This allows the Saint to walk up to him and tell him that they are friends of Garviel Loken and that she knows about the conflict within his soul, watching his legion turn so irrevertibly away from its previous self, and he does indeed agree to help them. Euphrates Keeler tells him that he would no longer be known as the Half Herd, in fact his voice would be heard above all others, which that is true considering his actions. Cruz takes them out before the massacre of the Remembrancer begins and takes them to another embarkation deck where he has a brief fight with Magard, kills him with a little bit of help, and then escapes on a Thunderhawk. This is again where we see Euphrates Keeler, the saint, do strange shit. See, this is the thing that is really interesting in this. So, when Kunal Sindeman got the message that the saint was in trouble, we know that was not a message from the Emperor, we know that was from Ing Mei Singh. However, Euphrates Keeler knows things she could not possibly know, which begs the question, maybe she is actually receiving messages of some sort from Big E, or an entity that is at the very least aligned with Big E. Possibly this is not even the Emperor himself as a corporeal being, this might be the very earliest forms of the Emperor as a deity. His worship is limited at this point in time, but it is possible that it is enough to have created a warp entity known as the Emperor that obviously would be aligned with the Emperor that would maybe be helping out. It's a bit hard to say, or possibly it was Keela herself, that is just a really, really powerful psyche, that sent these messages to Ing Mei Singh and told her that she had to send these messages, etc. It's hard to tell at this point, but she knows that Nathaniel Garrow is their ally. She knows that she can flee to the Eisenstein and expect Garrow, somebody she has never met or probably even heard of before, to help them. Now, no matter how you twist and turn that, that is quite unusual, <laughs> let's just say. She really should not be able to know any of this, yet she seems so utterly and completely certain. And she is proven correct. Nathaniel Garrow allows them to land on his ship and he believes them. Granted, we will be knowing a little bit more about that later in a later book, which shows that Nathaniel Garrow had very, very good reasons to believe her in the first place, but still, he understands and he accepts that the warning needs to be taken to the wider Imperium, and begins faking engine trouble to drift as far away from the fleet as possible. He knows that escaping from this situation will be exceedingly difficult, but he has to try. Meanwhile, down on the planet below, the virus bombardment has not had the intended effect. It has dealt some damage to the Loyalists, but being Adeptus Astartes, most of them have actually managed to get to safety. This is quickly relayed back up to the fleet, and before Horus can decide what his next move is to be, Angron decides he needs to take shit in his own hands. 
And without awaiting orders from the Warmaster, he launches his own second wave, bringing his loyal wood bearers down upon the loyalists below. Horus is at first absolutely incensed with anger over this. Angron is clearly disobeying him in the most blatant form possible, and briefly, he considers going ahead with another planetary bombardment, regardless of the fact that Angron is down there. However, he relents, and begins turning this to his favour. This shows us just how smart Horus is. He instantly recognises that if he lets Angron have his way here, Angron will also realise that he is allowed to get away with this. That he is given freedom under Horus that he was not under the Emperor. He also recognises the potential benefits of blooding his Astartes against their loyalist brothers. He would be getting them used to fighting other legionnaires. There are definitely benefits, although the cost of rooting out the Loyalists is going to be a hell of a lot higher than originally intended. If anything though, I'm kind of surprised Horus didn't see this coming. It's fucking Angron! He must have absolutely hated the idea of cleansing his legion through treachery like this. Frankly, I'm kind of surprised he even went along with it to begin with. Angron has a twisted sense of honour, or at the very least he used to. It would undoubtedly have sat very, very ill with him to do it this way. It just, it stinks too much of treachery for Angron. And don't get me wrong, Angron is entirely fine with betraying his legion as long as they are the ones who are not loyal to him, but he would much prefer to do it openly, with weapon in hand, not this shadowy game of backstabs and daggers, it's just not his style. But he got all of the butchery he wanted when he landed on the planet with some 50 companies of World Eaters. And this began the final phase of the battle for Istvan III. It would last for several months, with loyalists fighting traitors. The traitors could possibly have crushed the remaining loyalists swiftly if they had acted cautiously. However, they were completely and utterly convinced that they would be fighting the shattered remnants of the loyalists. Additionally, they viewed the loyalists as the traitors, obviously enough. They considered them to be the worst of them, those who had betrayed their primarchs and betrayed everything their legion stood for, a uh, opinion that the loyalists almost certainly held in equal force for the traitors. This meant that many of the traitor legions attacked the loyalists without any regard for their usual caution or proper assault protocols. The Emperor's Children, for example, launched a large armoured column assault directly into the city, expecting to have to wipe out a few hundred survivors at most. This ended with disaster, as the Emperor's Children column was torn apart, trapped and ambushed in the Coral City, and suffered incredibly heavy casualties, to the point where the Emperor's Children's assault force had to withdraw entirely from the city and recuperate for days. And that was far from the last thing the Loyalists were going to inflict upon their traitorous brethren. Over the course of the next two and a half some months, they continued to hold out, under the command, interestingly enough, of Sal Tarvitz. Sal had shown himself that he was far from a normal line officer. The Emperor's children, Lord Commander Adolin being primary amongst them, had clearly massively underestimated his potential. He managed to hold out against a vastly superior force that had massive superiority in armour, titans, air power, and of course bombardment potential from orbit for over two months, inflicting catastrophic casualties upon the traitor legions, who together lost some 50 to 60,000 Astartes. This might be as much as two-thirds of their total numbers. The loyalists had most definitively paid their traitorous brethren back in full. 
And at the end of the campaign, even after a betrayal by Lucius, who almost wiped out the remainder of the Loyalists, they managed to hold off the last huge concentrated effort to overwhelm them. And as the traitors finally left the planet, the Loyalists still stood undefeated upon the surface of Istvan V. This time, however, Horus was not going to try and finish them off with a virus bombardment. He initiated a day-long concentrated orbital bombardment of the Coral City that would not end until the entire city was leveled utterly and completely. This did not set well with some of his brothers. This was not a good start to their rebellion. Mortarion had been unable to clean out his Death Guard, who now occupied the very bunker complex they had previously been told to assault. Lord Commander Adolin had made a complete and utter fool of himself when he ordered the initial armoured assault upon the Coral City and lost a considerable portion of his armour, not to mention giving the Loyalists a ton of heavy weapons, gift-wrapped on a silver platter. And Angron had to quite literally be dragged onto one of the last ships to leave Istvan, he had to be physically restrained to keep him from going after his last surviving brethren, still alive and still giving one big fat fucking middle finger to Angron and his dogs. For Horus, at least, the campaign was a bit more successful. During one of the last assaults, both Gavriel Loken and Tariq Togaden had been killed by Abaddon and Horus Aximund. So at the very least, he had managed to get rid of his greatest detractors, the other half of the Mournival. With them dead, or, well, apparently dead anyways, he had achieved most of his goals. He had cleansed his legion and the three immediate legions nearby. He had bloodied them against fellow legions, which meant they would not hesitate next time. And he had made a rather clear statement to everyone else what it would mean to cross him. He probably would have preferred to not have bloodied his legions quite as much as he lost somewhere along the lines of uh, two thirds to 50% of his total force, which that was probably a bit more than he wanted, and that is not taken into consideration the Loyalists, of course. So it could have gone better, but at the end of the day, the deed had been done and the trap had been laid. The unfortunate escape of the light cruiser the Eisenstein was... Um, an unfortunate mishap, since that meant that the Emperor might receive word of what horses had done far earlier than he would have wanted, but... It was a minor problem, for the moment at least. Besides, his new friends and allies in the warp had already assured him that they would do something about it. The Eisenstein would never reach anyone. At the very least, so Horus hoped. And that brings us rather neatly to the end of the third book. This concludes the first portion of the Horus Heresy. This concludes Horus's fall to the quote-unquote dark side and him cleansing his legion. And with the escape of the Eisenstein, it neatly sets the table for uh, the shit that is to come. Whether or not the Eisenstein makes it to anybody it's special, well, we'll have to wait and see, shan't we? Until then, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.